Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I've got a couple minutes past seven. So hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight for this Wi-Fi 101 Direct Link community class. My name is Connor, and with me today is Jason Nugent. We're on the marketing team here at Direct Link. Jason's going to be helping me to answer questions and provide additional resources. Um, first of all, um, if anybody here tonight with us registered for the morning in-person class, um, we're sorry that uh, that couldn't happen today. Um, I don't know that anybody was really expecting the weather to turn out the way that it did. Um, I saw a stat that for the Portland area, it was the second most amount of snow in a 24-hour period since 1943, I believe it was. So um, some crazy stuff going on out there, and I hope everybody is safe and warm. Um, but thank you for being here with us tonight. We hope this is an informative class for you. Um, okay, so today we are going to take a 101 approach to how Wi-Fi connectivity works and give you uh, a better idea about some of the common terms and processes that you may have heard about before. We talked a little bit about Wi-Fi in our Internet 101 class earlier last year, um, and today we're going to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive. Some of the stuff that we talk about may be a little bit of a review, um, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some more Wi-Fi specific um, components. So the goal is to help um, give you a better understanding about how your connection works and why things happen the way that they do. So if you've ever had the frustrating buffering wheel pop up when and trying to stream a movie, um, you'll have a better idea after this class of why that can sometimes happen and then what can be done to remedy it. And I see your chat. Hello, Michelle. Thanks for joining us from Maxburg. All right. So a couple of housekeeping things before we jump into the content today. Um, so this class is being recorded um, and it will be available to rewatch online at that link you can see there on the screen, directlink.coop slash classes. Just want everybody to know that the only person being recorded is me, as well as the content you can see on the screen. Nobody else's names or anything like that are being recorded. So just wanted to let you know. Um, and also, you can use the chat button here to ask questions. And if you don't see this little toolbar appear on your screen, um, if you're on a laptop or a desktop computer, just sort of move your mouse around on the main screen where you can see me. You should see that toolbar pop up where you can see the chat button. Or if you're on a, a tablet device, just tap your finger on the screen and you should see that toolbar pop up either from the top or the bottom of the screen. You can click the chat button and then um, ask questions or leave comments in the chat. And then um, one of us here will um, either answer it I'll either answer it um, in person um, here over the presentation or Jason will provide additional info in the chat. Okay, um, also on that page there, you can find additional details and recordings of past classes that we've done um, as well as future class offerings when information becomes available on them. Okay. So I wanna just share a couple of helpful resources real quick. Um, the first one here is a link to the Direct Link Internet support pages. These have a wealth of information and answers to common internet questions uh, and connection questions. The second one here is a speed test tool. So you can see if you're getting speeds close to what you subscribe to. And we're going to talk a little bit about internet speed tests um, a little bit down the line tonight. The third link here and I think Jason is gonna, he's putting these links in the chat there as well. So if anybody wants to open them in a browser and bookmark them or um, save them for later, they're gonna be in the chat. So we talked about speed test link. The next one is um, that shows the current project map and corresponding timeline uh, for our service area fiber build. So you can type in your address to see where you're at. Um, and if your home doesn't have fiber yet, you can sort of see the timeline there that's listed with that. And then the fourth one down at the bottom is the community classes page that I talked about earlier. You can watch recordings and get more info on past and future classes. Thanks, Jason, for putting those in the chat there. Okay, so um, we just want to preface just a little bit. We're not necessarily able to take a look at your personal connection situation today. Um, we can certainly 
um, take down your information and situation. If you have a question that's specific to your home, your subscription, your connection, um, and then we can have one of our team members look into that for you and get back to you. But I will invite you to, if you have questions specific to your account, your subscription, to give your local member services team a call um, and they would be happy to answer any questions specific to your account. Okay, so before we get started, Let's take a look real quick at the wonders of Wi-Fi technology and see what sorts of amazing things one can do with it. Okay. The X10s are online. Gentlemen, I am now about to send a signal from this laptop through our local ISP, racing down fiber optic cable at the speed of light to San Francisco, bouncing off a satellite in geosynchronous orbit to Lisbon, Portugal, where the data packets will be handed off to submerged transatlantic cables terminating in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and transferred across the continent via microwave relays back to our ISP and the X10 receiver attached to this. Lamp. <laughs> I've got goosebumps. <laughs> Are we ready on the stereo? Go for stereo. So this is a funny scene from the TV show Big Bang Theory where the guys use the internet to send a signal uh, all around the globe that eventually turns on the lamp in their living room and their stereo. So, um, of course, nowadays there's smart home technology that uh, lets you control these sorts of things with uh, just your voice. So this just kind of goes to show some of the amazing things that the internet can do, um, even if on the surface it may seem um, like somewhat of a, a rudimentary task, right? Um, another funny story that I wanted to share uh, about using the internet um, for perhaps a rather menial task as well is actually about the world's first webcam. So in 1991, a pair of students at the University of Cambridge in England, Quentin Stafford Fraser and Paul Jardetsky, they developed an ingenious plan that solved the biggest problem of their time walking into the computer lab to discover that the coffee pot was empty. <laughs> and to save people the disappointment of finding the coffee pot empty when they walked in there, they actually set up a camera and then built a program called X Coffee that you can kind of see here on the screen. And that program provided a live picture of the coffee pot to all desktop computers that were on that building's network. The camera was eventually connected to the internet in the early, early days of the World Wide Web and sort of gained um, international fame as an early snapshot of the capabilities of the internet before it was um, ceremoniously retired in 2001. So just kind of wanted to share um, some early inspiration for some of these uh, internet connection and Wi-Fi technologies um, that we are so used to today and that have advanced so much. All right. So before we talk about Wi-Fi, we first just need to talk about the differences between the internet and Wi-Fi. And this is, again, going to be a little bit of review for those of you that attended our Internet 101 class. But I just wanted to make sure I'm, and touch on it again real quick. So sometimes we hear that internet and Wi-Fi are the same thing or that maybe someone says they don't need internet service, they just want Wi-Fi. But the truth is that there is no Wi-Fi without physical internet infrastructure that allows data signals to travel between different points. That's the internet infrastructure that's set up. So again, internet service is the signal that gets sent from our central office to your home over our internet infrastructure. Wi-Fi, on the other hand, is the wireless distribution of some of that signal through the air. Devices can then connect to that signal wirelessly and access the internet to stream movies and shows, play games, have video chats, send emails, so on and so forth, right? Um, devices can also connect to the internet through a direct wired connection as well, which we'll discuss in just a moment. Um, but first, how exactly do um, internet signals travel back and forth to your devices? We'll, we'll talk about all this in a little bit. Um, also, as kind of a fun fact, Wi-Fi is actually not an abbreviation for wireless fidelity, which some folks might think. And it doesn't actually really mean anything. 
Um, However, around the time that Wi-Fi was created, the term hi-fi, which is short for high fidelity, was a term commonly used to describe the high quality reproduction of sound and images. Um, so in 1999, a group of major companies in the electronics industry formed a nonprofit called the Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance, which is now known as the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, and they decided to call this new wireless internet technology Wi-Fi because it was a, a catchy name and it sounded similar to Hi-Fi, uh, which many people were already familiar with. It was also a little bit easier to say than all of the techno jargon um, that really means Wi-Fi, right? So the name stuck and we still use it today. All right, so there are several steps and multiple pieces of equipment involved along the way that allow your devices to connect uh, to the internet through a wireless connection, a Wi-Fi connection. Um, on internet infrastructure other than fiber, like copper cabling, for example, um, a modem would connect your home network to your internet service provider or ISP, that's us. Um, while a router lets your devices use that internet connection. On fiber networks, however, the signal from the ISP travels over the fiber lines as beams of light, which of course travel at the speed of light. They then reach what is essentially a modem, and it's called an optical network terminal. Um, some of you likely have one of these on the outside of your home, perhaps in the garage. It's a, a little gray box that um, has some um, connections running in and out of it. So once the signal reaches the ONT on your house, the beams of light um, are then converted by the ONT into electrical signals and are then sent to your router through ethernet cabling running through your walls. The router then sends those signals to your devices, either through Wi-Fi or through a wired connection, which we'll get into next. So let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi connections and why you might use them. All right, so we mentioned that Wi-Fi connections allow you to connect devices to your home network and receive internet data signals wirelessly. So this is gonna be the primary way to connect most modern devices to your home's internet connection. So think about devices like smartphones, tablets, handheld gaming systems, streaming TV devices like an Amazon Fire TV stick or a Roku box. Um, these are devices that are generally gonna be connected to your Wi-Fi network um, pretty much because they can't connect to a wired connection. There's Your smartphone doesn't have a port to be plugged into an ethernet connection. Now, since the internet signal is being broadcast wirelessly through the air, there is the possibility of interference occurring that can impact the strength and the speed of the wireless signals. We'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, but you can think of it sort of like a radio signal. Your radio or your devices might not be able to hear that signal in some places unless it's strong enough um, without interference getting in the way. Think about it like if you're trying to listen to a Portland area station um, in Bend or in Southern Oregon, you're not gonna have a signal that's gonna allow you to listen to that over those airwaves. Um, in addition to external interference, um, the age and the software capabilities of your router and your individual devices can play a role in the performance of your overall Wi-Fi experience. So if you have a 10-year-old router, for example, hidden away in your hallway closet behind a bunch of books and movies and things like that, and that's powering your Wi-Fi network, it's probably not going to be giving you the full capability that you could have with a newer system that is fully optimized. And we'll talk more about this in just a moment. So with this situation, even if you subscribe to gigabit service, some of the fastest speeds out there, um, your router might not be able to get that full potential to your devices if it's an older model and it doesn't have the guts, the hardware inside of it that's capable of deploying those kinds of fast speeds. And then the same thing goes for individual devices as well. Just as an example, if you're trying to stream a, a new HD movie or play a modern game on a device that's getting up there in age, like if you're trying to stream 4K video on an iPhone 4, um, you're probably going to have a slower experience and it's not going to be the most uh, optimal situation that it could be. So um, let's talk a little bit about wired connections next since we just went over Wi-Fi connections. So again, once the internet signal um, reaches your router, we saw in our previous slide that devices can connect to the router via a Wi-Fi signal, but they can also connect to your router with a wired connection through an ethernet port. 
Um, and in addition to the router, you might have additional ethernet outlets in your home. So you could also plug a device directly into the wall out of an ethernet port in some cases. Um, now the graphic that I have here on the screen shows um, the internet going to a modem and then the router. And this is traditionally um, how it would work with uh, copper connections. Um, and I mentioned that with new fiber connections, the modem in the house is essentially replaced by the ONT that's on the outside of your house. That's a modern device um, that works better with fiber connections and gives you that optimal fast experience. Um, and then it reaches the router and then you can connect from the router with a physical ethernet cord to, to a device. Um, you can do this or you can do a Wi-Fi connection, which we just talked about. So let's take a look more at uh, why you might use a wired connection and the sorts of scenarios in which you might do so. So um, as we mentioned, in addition to a wireless connection to your home network, AKA Wi-Fi, right? You can connect to your network through a direct wired connection using an ethernet cord. And that looks just like this one that I have up here on the screen. Um, it looks a little bit like a phone cord, but it's thicker and it won't fit into a traditional phone jack. Your home likely has one or more special ports in the wall that are specifically designed for an ethernet cord. Um, this cord can then be plugged directly into a variety of types of devices for a direct connection into your home internet network. And what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm gonna launch a poll that will show up on your screen here. And I'm just wondering, does anybody at home run wired ethernet connections to any of their devices right now? Is everybody just using Wi-Fi or is anybody out there actually using wired ethernet connections for any of their devices? Okay, I see votes coming in, awesome. Okay, all right. Nice, awesome. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and then I'm gonna share our results here. So you should be able to see these on the screen. So um, about 40% of our respondents here to this little poll say that they actually are running some wired ethernet connections. Um, and then the other 60% are not. That's actually a little bit more than I thought it was gonna be. So thanks everybody for, for sharing that information. All right. Um, and I bring this up because there are a number of reasons why you might actually want to use a wired connection at home. Um, first, since you are literally plugged into your home network, you, you have that direct connection. Um, you don't have to fight through all the other things going on in the air like you do when you're on a Wi-Fi connection. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. Um, but that Wi-Fi connection, um, again, could have some interference which makes a wired connection uh, more stable and more reliable and actually delivers faster speeds overall. Um, let's see. So which devices might you plug into your network with an ethernet cord? For me personally at home, um, I have a cord running to my Nintendo Switch gaming console for uh, just wanna make sure I have that stable, reliable connection when I'm playing games online. I also have one running right to my smart TV down in the living room um, so that when we're streaming shows and movies, we have the best possible connection to our home internet. So a wired connection is best for devices that you, you, you again wanna make sure have that direct line to your network for the most reliable signal. And these are generally gonna be devices that don't move around a lot, right? Or maybe bigger devices like computers, gaming systems, smart TVs, that sort of thing. So, however, I do wanna make note that Wi-Fi equipment is becoming more and more advanced and routers are now capable of delivering internet speeds at almost the same rate as ethernet cords are. Uh, the new routers that we at DirectLink are working to deploy to our members currently are fantastic and honestly make it so that you don't even really need wired connections. They are that good. Okay. So when it comes to the actual Wi-Fi signal itself that travels through the air, there's actually two different types of signals that your devices can access. These two signal bands operate on separate frequencies in the air. One is a 2.4 gigahertz band and the other is a five gigahertz band. And you can essentially think of this like AM and FM radio frequencies. So most Wi-Fi routers are able to transmit both signal bands at the same time. And your devices can generally connect to either one of them. Um, I wanna talk about the differences between these two signal bands and why you might wanna use one or over the other. 
um, and how they, they sort of work. So the 2.4 band is best for devices that move around a lot throughout the day or that are farther away overall from your main Wi-Fi access point, like your smartphone, for example, especially if you have a large home. Um, the 2.4 band has a longer overall range and can actually penetrate solid objects a little bit more easily, like thick walls or furniture. Um, the 2.4 frequency is also used by many other electronic devices, however, um, like microwaves, baby monitors, security cameras, and garage door openers. So what can happen is if you have many of these devices in your home, or if you live in an apartment complex or a condo complex um, where there's lots of other people um, using some of these types of devices, that 2.4 gigahertz frequency can actually become congested more often, which can impact the speed and the signal quality to devices that are on that frequency. On the other hand, however, the five gigahertz band is best for devices that are closer to your router so that they can take advantage of the faster speeds that the five gigahertz frequency offers. Um, think about devices like a gaming console, a smart TV, or a home computer. Again, devices that are closest to your um, to your Wi-Fi access point. The five gigahertz band is also ideal for devices that engage in higher bandwidth activities online, like, like online gaming, video calling, or streaming 4K Ultra HD movies. That's because the five gigahertz band can deliver faster speeds to the devices than the 2.4 gigahertz band. Okay, in addition, older devices may only be able to connect to the 2.4 band, while newer ones may be able to connect to both the 2.4 and the 5 bands. So again, think of this sort of like older radios only being able to get the AM frequency um, and then not the FM frequency. So you might be wondering how to change which frequency a device is connected to, right? So with some Wi-Fi routers and systems, this is a manual process where you would actually have two different Wi-Fi SSIDs. That's your network name, the name of your Wi-Fi. Um, and then you would have two different ones that would show up in the list of networks when you go to connect a device, one labeled 2.4 gigahertz and one labeled five gigahertz. Um, but with our new routers that we're putting in, out here at DirectLink, they actually have software built into them that automatically assigns your devices to the most optimal network for the situation that that device is in and reevaluates things periodically. So if the router notices that a device is on one frequency but isn't having the best connection experience, it will optimize things and move the device over to the other frequency to make sure that you are getting the best experience possible. It's pretty cool, these new devices and how they work. Okay. So I wanted to share a couple of quick tips for how to improve your Wi-Fi signal that we've sort of touched on a little bit already. Um, and this first one is what our technicians essentially will do when they install your equipment. Um, the router should be placed in a central location free of obstructions like you can see in this little graphic here. So we don't want the router hidden away behind a bunch of books, other objects, um, or other things that could block the Wi-Fi signal from reaching where it needs to be. I use the example of a router hidden in a hallway closet somewhere behind a bunch of movies and books. Um, that can create obstructions that limit the signal um, that can get sent out from your router. Even if it's on that 2.4 band, that can still limit the experience of that Wi-Fi signal. The next is something we talked touched on just a little bit, is to try and reduce reduce the interference from other devices that emit a wireless frequency. Um, so we mentioned how the new direct link routers will help to manage this for you. Um, and finally, make sure that you've got enough internet speed coming into your home to support all of your devices. And I've got just another poll here that I'm gonna launch real quick for you guys. Okay, so I wanna know how many devices do you guys have connected to your home network right now. Think about your TVs, your smartphones, maybe you have printers, gaming systems, things like that. We've got a nice spread going on here. Okay. Nice, awesome, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks everybody. I'm gonna share our results now. So we've got a nice little spread here. Um, 
about 40% of folks say they've got one to five devices connected to their network, 33% have got six to 10, 13% have 11 to 15 devices, we're getting up there now, 4% have 16 to 20, and then 8% of our attendees have 20 or more devices connected to their home network. Yeah. All right. And I bring this up because the average Average home in the United States now has an average of 25 devices connected to their home network at one time. And all of those devices on your network compete for bandwidth. They compete for the speed that's coming into your home. And if there isn't enough to go around, then that's where you'll start to see interruptions or that frustrating buffering wheel pop up when you're trying to watch a movie, right? And we'll talk about some of the activities that go on online that take up your bandwidth. Um, now, I did this exercise for myself at home, and um, I underestimated how many devices that I have. Um, there's two of us here in my home, and we actually have about 23 connected devices between the two of us. Um, I think I forgot our printer. Um, I forgot one computer, and then um, I forgot we actually have a couple of smart speakers connected as well. They're um, Google Home speakers. So um, there may be some that you don't realize might be connected to your Wi-Fi network, but it's just a good exercise to think about, okay, how much stuff, how many devices do I actually have and how many of them are connected to my network and are doing stuff? Okay, um, so not to toot our own horn here too much, um, the majority of DirectLink members recently saw some significant increases to their internet speeds. Um, we want our members to have the best possible connection experience um, and fast, reliable speeds do just that. Plus our lowest speeds on fiber connections are now at 100 megabits per second download speeds and 50 megabit per second upload speeds. Um, and we'll get into more details about those different types of internet speeds here shortly. Okay, so. Um, I just want to touch on how older devices can actually slow down your network. So older devices with limited Wi-Fi communication tech built into them, they translate, uh, transmit, excuse me, and receive uh, information much more slowly. So their kind of slow conversations with the router take up the airwaves and force modern, faster devices to wait longer for a break in communication. So. Imagine all of your Wi-Fi devices sort of taking turns to talk to the router. Um, when it's the older device's turn, it communicates more slowly and every other device has to wait a little bit longer for it to finish talking to the router. But when it's a faster device's turn to communicate with the router, it can still communicate just as quickly. Um, there's a slowdown while the new devices sort of twiddle their thumbs, right? Waiting longer than usual for the older device to communicate with the router, excuse me. You can also sort of imagine this um, with the older devices connected being sort of like a NASCAR pace car. Um, it does its thing at the speed it wants to, right? And then the others have to sort of wait behind it until it's off the track um, so that they can speed up afterwards. Okay. So I just wanted to quickly also go over um, some of the poor that you'll find on common Wi-Fi routers. Now, this is the back of the new Wi-Fi routers that DirectLink is working on getting into people's homes. Um, I don't have every single thing here um, that's, that's shown in this picture highlighted. I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the important things and the things that, that you can work with. There are some um, other ports and buttons here that um, are really for the technicians during the setup process or for updating the firmware of the router itself. So um, number one here, these are uh, outlets that can be used to connect phone systems that utilize what's known as a VoIP network. That is what's known as voice over internet protocol. So that's when a phone system uses the internet to make and receive telephone calls rather than traditional phone lines. Um, number two here, that's the yellow, the four yellow ports there. Those are what are known as LAN ports or local area network. They're also known as ethernet ports. So these are what's used to connect devices to your network with a wired setup like we talked about earlier. If you've got a computer that you wanna plug directly into your home network with an ethernet cord, one of these four ports is what you would plug that uh, computer into. Right next to that, number three, that is the WAN port. And that stands for the Wide Area Network. 
And that's essentially what's used to allow the router to access the internet signal sent to your home's ONT from our central office. Um, so the WAN port connects to an ethernet cord that's plugged into a wall outlet, and then it just connects your router to the internet overall, whereas the yellow LAN ports allow your devices to connect to the internet. Okay. All right. So number four over here, um, these are both power ports for the router. There's two different ones that can be used for differing voltages for the electronic wiring in the home. Um, but nowadays, actually, with these new routers, um, uh, depending on which Ethernet cord is used, there's actually some newer, more advanced Ethernet cords out there. Um, they can actually receive power to the router directly through the Ethernet cord as, uh, as well. And some may not even need a power cord. They may be powered on with just an Ethernet connection. Again, um, the technician that comes into your home will take all will take care of all of this for you. But um, I just thought that some folks might be wondering um, what some of these things are. So I wanted to go over them quickly. All right. So when we talk about internet speeds, there's really two separate categories. You've got up, uh, download speeds and you've got upload speeds. And they're both important in their own ways. So download speeds are most commonly advertised by internet service providers, while upload speeds are sometimes hidden or not really discussed at all. And that's usually because their upload speeds are much slower than their download speeds. Um, and just another little bit of a shameless plug here, uh, direct links upload speeds are actually up to 10 times faster than other providers in the area, and they are clearly listed right on our website. Um, so the reason that traditionally upload speeds are lower than download speeds is because people have generally downloaded data from the internet at higher rates than they upload data to the internet. So the demand for download speeds has been greater. But as we become more and more connected and do more things online, the demand for greater upload speeds um, has been steadily increasing. And we'll talk about in a moment some of those different activities that have caused that demand to increase. So let's take a look first at um, some uh, online activities that require download speeds. Okay, so think about, again, we are accessing the internet and we're pulling information or data down from the internet to view or to interact with on our device. Think about things like streaming movies, shows, and music. Um, and I've got a little example about the internet speed or the bandwidth that's necessary to do these types of activities on a single device. So just as an example, um, streaming a regular HD movie on a device, um, one single TV is going to use about six to eight megabits per second of internet bandwidth. Um, however, as we start to get into higher quality video streaming, higher quality audio sound like Dolby Atmos and some of these different things that are coming out now and more available, that's going to use more internet bandwidth. So streaming 4K um, shows and movies and then having that advanced audio systems streaming with it, that can actually use upwards of 40 megabits per second per device. So I just want you to think about these things and think about how much speed do you have um, and, and what sort of things are going on in your home. Um, more examples of download activities, just simply downloading files from an email um, to your computer, or maybe saving an image or downloading a video game. Um, scrolling through social media apps. Um, you are looking at information on the internet and it's pulling it down to your device. Um, and then again, just sort of surfing the web, loading a website to view. All of these things use download speeds um, to perform. Okay, let's take a look next at some upload activities. So this is again, when you are sending information from your devices up to the internet. Um, now, some activities require both upload and download speeds at the same time to work. Um, think about playing an online game as an example. Um, when you're moving your character around or doing something in the game, you're actually sending data up to the internet. But there are also other things going on that need to send data down from the internet in that game, like when you interact with other players, as an example. Um, that information then gets sent up to the internet from the other player and then down from the internet for you to see on your screen. And then the same thing goes for video calls. If you're on a video call with somebody else, either through FaceTime on your smartphone or even right now through a Zoom call, um, I am sending my video up to the internet and then it is being pulled down from the internet on your devices. So we are using both upload and download speeds at the same time, okay? Same sort of thing, like if you're sending files or photos over email or a messaging service, 
you're taking that information, that piece of data, that file, and sending it up to the internet over to somebody else. Same thing with backing up um, or uploading files to a cloud storage service like um, Google Drive, um, uh, Microsoft OneDrive, one of those storage services, you're uploading a file to the internet. And then we talked about video chatting and playing games online. So um, I hope this gives a little bit better sense about the difference between downloads and uploads and why those two different kinds of speeds matter. Okay, so we, of course, want you to get the most out of your service. But as we've learned today, there are some factors that can limit your overall connection experience. And running an internet speed test can give you a better idea of what's going on if you're experiencing interruptions or slow speeds, especially if you subscribe to fast internet speeds. So running a test on Wi-Fi may not come as close to your full internet speed that you're subscribed to because it's not a direct connection wired right into your home network. So it's not necessarily the best method to tell if there's an issue with the bandwidth or the speed that's coming into your home. The reason that we're doing an internet test, uh, a speed test, is to just make sure that you're getting um, as close as possible to the speeds that you subscribe to. And as we've learned, there's several different factors that can prevent that from happening. So if we run a speed test on a Wi-Fi connection, um, there's a variety of different things that can interfere with the actual test itself. Um, we, we've talked about a few of those. So um, what you really want to do is use a device on a wired connection to run the speed test so that you can get a more true reading of the speed that's coming into your home. Um, however, if you run both tests, one on wired and one on a wireless connection, um, and you notice that the Wi-Fi speed um, or the, the speed that it shows coming to the device where you did the test on, uh, on Wi-Fi, if you notice that that one is significantly lower than the wired test, this could indicate that there's an issue with the Wi-Fi signal that's coming from your router. Um, you could also receive a low speed rating if you're using an older ethernet cable um, that doesn't support some of the faster speeds of today. Um, that's you know similar to using a super old router. Um, and really to get the most accurate reading, uh, we recommend that you run at least two speed tests so that we can sort of see the average between the two because there may be some variance between tests depending on what's going on your network at that point in time. But um, whatever your issues may be, our tech support team can definitely help troubleshoot them and uh, find a solution for you. So um, this image here, this is uh, from a speed test that I ran the other day from my desk. Um, at, at direct link. Um, we've got a few different terms and numbers going on. And first of all, um, Jason, if you could pop that speed test link in the chat one more time, uh, this site is actually hosted on the direct link website. It is uh, speed.direct, or is it speed or speed test? Oh, he'll put it in the chat. I forget. I'm sorry. Speed.directlink.coop. Thanks, Jason. Um, so this is where you can run a speed test on your network. Um, so we've got a couple of different terms and numbers going on here in this image that I have on the screen. Um, so first you've got your upload and your download speed, which will tell you the speed that you're getting at that point in time and on the device that you're doing the test from. Um, you can only see the download speed on mine just because I, that's when I took the screenshot. I didn't get the full test in, sorry about that. Um, so we talked about why you would want to do a, a speed test on a, a wired device over a wireless device earlier. So you can get that more accurate reading of the speed that's coming into your home. So you've got your upload and your download speeds. Then you have ping, which is listed in the top left of that white box there. And that is essentially the reaction time of your internet connection. It's how long it takes for the data signal to travel from your device to the internet server. For ping, the lower the number, the better, okay? Then below that, you have a measurement called jitter. And that essentially measures the rate at which ping changes over a period of time. It's essentially the fluctuation or the variation of your ping speeds. Um, and then as with ping, the lower this number is, the better. Uh, I see a chat came in. I don't see the speed test link. Let's see. Oh, I think Jason, can you go ahead and resend that to everybody? Um, all attendees. I think um, he accidentally just sent it to me personally. <laughs> so you should be able to see that. There it is. Thanks for pointing that out. Appreciate it. Okay. So with ping and with jitter, these are mostly important 
really the most important to online gamers, um, especially those that play fast paced games. Because when you press a button on your controller to make your character on screen take an action, you want that action to happen immediately on screen. And many times gamers will actually refer to delays in their gaming actions as lag. That's sort of where that term comes in. Okay. Hopefully that gives a little bit better idea of how speed tests work, why you might want to use them, and how you might want to do them. Okay. So with all of these devices and online activities in mind, another thing to mention is that some internet service providers have internet data caps, or essentially a limit on how much internet you can actually use in a month. Um, and if you go over that limit with some providers, they can charge extra fees and significantly slow down your connection as a penalty. Um, but as direct link members with our service, there are no data caps on any of our speed tiers. You can stream and game as much as you want without worrying about extra speeds or slowed service. Okay. So just to give you kind of a, a look at what this, what this could look like. Some internet providers lower end data caps are around 300 gigabytes for the month. Um, certain online activities use up different amounts of data. So for example, Netflix says that about one hour of standard HD streaming uses about three gigabytes of data per hour. Um, while a 4K ultra HD movie, that's gonna use about seven gigabytes of data per hour. Um, so if we think about this, you know, multiplied over the period of a month, I think the average person watches around three to four hours of, of TV per day. Combine that with other activities that are going on in your home, like video chatting or using security cameras um, or just using the other devices that are in your home. That sort of data usage can really add up. Um, it can add up fast and it can significantly impact users' connection performances and their wallets if they're not careful. Um, but again, we don't think that's right. You guys made the smart choice of choosing direct link for your internet provider. Um, so you don't have anything to worry about. Just wanted to kind of talk about how that works. With that, that's it for the presentation today. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. We're going to stick around to answer any more questions that you might have. Um, you can also email us um, at hereforyou at directlink.coop with any additional questions, comments, or feedback that you might have. Um, we would also love some ideas for future community classes, um, if you have any. Um, I'd also love it if you could take the survey that's going to pop up once this meeting ends, um, and then let us know how we did today if you have um, any additional comments, and then Stay tuned for an announcement for the next community class. We'll be sending out our normal announcements on that shortly through email and on the website and other communication methods too. So um, if anybody has any additional questions, um, we're going to stick around for a little bit and make sure that uh, we answer them.